talk today about a、uh, one of the more foundational topics, and、um, so oftentimes the enemy wants to attack us at the foundation. And、uh, if we don't get our foundation right, then a lot of other things can be really, really messed up. So, I feel like we need to talk about this on a regular basis.、Uh, I first shared a study along these lines about four or five, four or five years ago, and、uh, I felt the need to readdress this. And、um, and so, we're going to talk today about the topic of Baptism. Baptism. Some people call that, especially in messianic circles, they like to call it mikvah.、Um, I'm going to be sharing why that is not a correct, the correct terminology, and the way they do it is also not correct according to scripture. But、um, baptism is an extremely important un- that we understand that for some reason it's been attacked. I think I know the reason. It's been attacked. It,、uh, the enemy has sought to confuse what it really means, and、uh, there are some church denominations that teach it's not an, not necessary.、Um, other people say, well, since you don't have to do it in order to be saved, you know, why bother doing it at all? And、uh, and so, and then we have those who believe different styles of baptism. Some choose to go forward when they baptize. Some choose to go straight down. Others choose to fall backwards. Others believe that、uh, no one's supposed to put their hands on you when you baptize, but that、um, you just kind of immerse yourself, and there'll be witnesses there. <coughs> and so, and then there's a confusion over what name you get baptized in. Is it the name of the Messiah, or is it Father, Son, the Holy Spirit?、Uh, there's just all kinds of You know, a wide variety of ideas as to what it really means and how you're supposed to do it, and whether or not it's even necessary for us.、Um, for for many centuries, the Catholic Church taught that, you know, you, the baby's born and you sprinkle the baby with water, and that's your baptism.、Uh, when I was a baby, I was sprinkled with water. Uh, in the Catholic Church, and、uh, of course I don't remember it; it's been a while. But、uh, that was their idea of baptism, and、uh, and then, you know, other denominations、uh, rose up after the Catholic Church reformers came along, like Luther and others,、um, and said, "Well, wait a minute.、It's、supposed to be a full immersion, a complete." Dipping underneath the water that's supposed to take place, and、uh, some people felt, well, what does it matter as long as you're baptized? And、uh, but there's just all kinds of thoughts on what it really means, and so we're going to talk about the question mikvah, or if you want to call it baptism, which one do you call it?、Uh, the true meaning and importance of it, and、um, the Key thing that we need to understand is, first of all, your heart has to be in the right place. You know, it's not just a, oh well, I'll go down the water. It's not like you're going to go take a bath or something. It's there's some significance to it in the spiritual realm that we need to understand. Now, baptism、um, in the name of Yahshua was never commanded specifically in the Torah. And so this is a new commandment given by our Savior Yahshua that He wants us to participate in.、Um, it was pictured, perhaps, in the you know the children of Israel going through the sea and the cloud and so on. But、um, no one was that. There's nowhere that Moshe says, "Go out and get baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah."、Um, and so this is a new commandment. That Yahshua the Messiah gave us, and I do accept new commandments. Some people don't believe we should accept new commandments, but I do.、Uh, if Yahweh was the inspiring force behind Scripture,、uh, I don't care where He said it, when He said it, how He said it, or through whom He said it. 
I want to do it. And so we have the example here of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Yahshua spoke, came and spoke to them, that's the disciples, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make, make disciples of all nations. Um, now, a disciple is one who is taught. The word disciple means taught one. Uh, what are they te what, is, what are they being taught? Okay, well, first of all, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And a lot of people, when they do baptism, they'll do Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then, disciples, the word disciples, meaning taught one, what's, what are we teaching them? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And though I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we, we read this in the um, book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18. Now notice he said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then later in Acts chapter 2, verses, uh, we'll start at verse 36, says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Elohim has made this Yahshua, whom you crucified, both Master and Messiah. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent. Repent means start following the teachings. Start obeying the voice of Yahweh. It means turn away from unrighteousness and turn toward righteousness and obedience. Let every And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahshua, Messiah, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as Yahweh, our mighty one, will call. Do you get this? This promise is to you who are standing there, their children, and all who are far off. That's that's tremendous. That's us, right? As many as are in within the listening sound of my voice, this is a promise to you. It says, and to your children, all who are far off. And so that's who we are. We are the ones who are far off. And it's something he promises us if we choose repentance and, of course, faith in Yahshua the Messiah accompanied by baptism. And there's a promise that we are given. What is it? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall. It doesn't say, doesn't say you might doesn't say he'll think about it. He says, you shall, as long as you've heard his call. As many as Yahweh, our mighty one, will call. Now, it's impossible for you to even have a desire for righteousness unless Yahweh had called you. But that's an awesome promise, and considering the hopeless state mankind's in, we've, we need this promise. And we see baptism is a major part of that promise of receiving that promise according to the scriptures. So I look at this and I ask the question, I mean, knowing that he's got this promise, and he's got these commandments, why on earth would anybody think, ah, oh, you can do it if you want to or decide not to, oh, it's no big deal, you're not saved by it. Now, it why would we ever have such a mentality? I, I don't understand that mentality. He says do it, and then you say, well, I'm not saved by it, so I don't have to do it. Um, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would you not do it? Um, to, in my mind, um, if Yahweh came to me in a bolt of lightning and said, stand on your head ten minutes a day, then I say to him, no, I'm not going to do it. Because I'm not saved by what you say. I mean, that's silly. That's ridiculous. I mean, if I, if I was to manifest such a, a uh, rebellious heart, how can I say I'm a repentant person? 
And I think that's one of the reasons why a baptism is given. It kind of cuts to the chase. I mean, you have to do something publicly that, you know, some people might view a little bit embarrassing. You have to go out there into the water and dunk and, and all that and go through this ritual. And I think that's one of the reasons why people resist it sometimes. But, I mean, why would we say, eh, no, I have to, it don't make no difference. Well, when he says to do it, and he says when you do it, you get the promises. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, I don't know, this, I don't get people's mentality. Um, it'd be like a a child who uh, who said, "Well, Dad, I don't have to do what you say because you'll still not throw me out, right? <laughs> if if I don't go take out the trash, will you throw me out? No. All right, then I won't take out the trash. <laughs> Why would you have that mentality if you're really his son, his son? I mean, I would hope you don't. So, all right, verse forty. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Take out the trash, right? Get the trash into the river and let it float down the river. And be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So there is a you know, some people who are going to gladly receive his word, and there will be some people who just apparently do not. And uh, I don't know. I want to gladly receive his word. How about you? I hope that you're one of those who will gladly receive it. So he told them to be safe from this perverse generation. I'll tell you what, if they were living in a perverse generation, uh, yeah, we are also, definitely. So... So if you're looking for salvation, the answer is really quite simple. Turn away. The word repent means to turn. Turn away from unrighteousness. Turn toward righteousness and become a believer in the Messiah Yahshua as evidenced by the external confession and display of faith through the act of baptism. There's no, really, no way around that scripture. It's very simple. Uh, because the truth is, you can't make your own heart clean. Proverbs 20, verse 9 says, Who can say I've made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Ecclesiastes seven twenty says, There is not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin. First John 1, 8 says, If we ha say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, because we sin, we need to be reconciled to Yahweh. We've all failed Him. And the only thing that's going to reconcile us to him is that we have righteousness dwelling in us. Wickedness is not going to make it into the kingdom. The wickedness you see on the earth today, it will not always be here, and I praise Yahweh for that. But the evil we see in our own world, in our own hearts, in fact, will not always be here. And so we need to somehow find a way for us to become righteous even though we haven't been. And so the only hope of entering into eternal life is that we are righteous and we have good news. And the good news is that there is a righteous kingdom Yahshua is going to establish on the earth. And, in, and we are called to enter into that kingdom. And he wants to establish that kingdom in us now as evidence that we will be willing to be part of that kingdom in the age to come. And that kingdom is going to be a kingdom of righteousness and that's why we need to turn away from unrighteousness and begin our journey of learning what righteousness is and walking that out and so how do we being wicked sinners receive righteousness did you know that the teachings and the prophets tell us how that's possible I don't even have to read necessarily the narrative of what Yahshua did for us. I can read about what he's going to do for us in the prophets, and especially in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of Yahweh. You're looking for an inheritance. 
and their righteousness is from who? Me, says Yahweh. That means our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from Yahweh. And that's our inheritance. And so, you know, we can't max manufacture our own righteousness. We've got a problem in that we have already sinned greatly in the eyes of Yahweh. And so how do we obtain it? How do we get there from here? How do we get Yahweh's righteousness right here in us so that he will accept us? He says he's willing to give you that, his righteousness. He's willing to give it to you. He says, your righteousness will be from me. So how can that happen? It's going to come from a king. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. And so it's from the seed of David. It's going to be a king. It's Jeremiah talking here, well after David's time. And it says, In his days Judah will be saved. They'll have salvation. And Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name. Whose name? The name of this branch of righteousness. This king. This is his name by which he will be called Yahweh our righteousness. Yahweh our righteousness. This is a prophecy. And um, this is his name by which he'll be called Yahweh, and it reads in the Hebrew, Yahweh Tzidkenu. Yahweh Tzidkenu. Yahweh our righteousness. So this king is going to carry his father's name, Yahweh. And he'll be called Yahweh Tzidkenu. Now that doesn't mean he's the heavenly father, but he does, as the son, carry his father's name. So it is through this king, we're going to call him Yahweh, our righteousness. We read just a minute ago that their righteousness is from me, says Yahweh. And so here's a man who's called Yahweh, our righteousness, because it is through him that Yahweh brought us our righteousness. Does that make sense? Through this king, this branch of righteousness that reigns and prospers, we will receive righteousness. There's other scriptures similar along these lines. Isaiah 45, 23, I've sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow. We probably recognize that from the New Testament, but this is actually where it's coming from. Every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in Yahweh I have righteousness. Only in Yahweh I have righteousness. And something else. Strength. That means the strength to live and breathe and walk in righteousness. So we're going... You now when Yahweh says he's going to swear an oath... It's time to stand up and pay attention. Because he doesn't do that very often. Okay, But he says, um, I have sworn by myself. Can't swear by anything greater than himself. <laughs> and so he swears by himself, this is what's going to happen, that you're going to take an oath and say, in Yahweh I have righteousness and strength. And that is the only way you can be righteous. To him men shall come and be, shall be ashamed. All shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In Yahweh all the descendants of Israel shall be what? Justified. And so here is a Old Testament prophecy in the book of Isaiah chapter 45 of what we know today from the book of Romans and other, other scriptures as justification 
by faith in the Son of Yahweh. Through him we have righteousness, and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Only in Yahweh I have righteousness. And this king, the reason why we are able to receive righteousness through him is because of what Yahweh did in him. Isaiah 53 verse 10 is another prophecy of the coming Messiah. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Talking about the resurrection here. Seeing his seed. That means the ones through whom he was able to give righteousness. The seed of righteousness. One place says... Um, in the book of Hebrews talking about Messiah here am I and the children whom Yahweh has gave it, given to me so Yahweh gave him children and so whose soul is this that's an offering for sin the Hebrew word for offering for sin is asham meaning a guilt offering and his soul is actually an asham a guilt offering so he shall prolong his days and we are the result of this very thing. So it says, He, Yahweh, shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify. There's that word again. Justify. We just saw this here. Shall be justified in Yahweh. In Yahweh Tzidkenu. We will be justified, right? And so... My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. In other words, he will take our iniquities upon himself. This is all predicted in the prophets. Earlier in verse, it says, um, I guess I don't have it up there, but earlier in verse 6 it says, Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so he bears our iniquities and becomes this offering for sin spoken of in verse 10 so that we can be granted righteousness so that we can be justified the word justify means to be declared righteous that's what the meaning of the word is to be declared righteous and so uh, it's pretty awesome really when you look in the prophets and you see the very things that we believe to be taught in the prophets it's really, really awesome. So another, another instance here is Isaiah 59, verse 15. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then Yahweh saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. His own righteousness it sustained him it sustained him so it pleased Yahweh to bruise him he's satisfied by the labor of the soul of the Messiah and it sustained him it, pl it pleased him it was it was sufficient that his own righteousness which he placed in the Messiah Yahshua caused us to be righteous we needed an intercessor and it was his own arm that did it. His own arm that brought salvation. And so, what's it say in Isaiah 53? We were reading from just a minute ago. Who has believed our report? Indicating not many people are going to believe this. And to whom has the, what? Arm of Yahweh been revealed. The Jewish people didn't, didn't see it, by and large. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, we, that's Isaiah, that's the Jewish people referenced here, as it were our faces from him, he was despised, and we, as in Israel, did not esteem him and they didn't 
just like Scripture predicted. They did not esteem him. And thus he wasn't necessarily a good-looking man. There was no comeliness about him. I wonder if that might be one reason why they rejected him. He didn't look the way they expected. Maybe he just looked like a regular guy, you know. <laughs> and that wasn't good enough for them. But they rejected him. And Yahweh used that to bring salvation to the whole world when he made his soul an asham, an offering for sin, a guilt offering. And so now this is all predicted that it was going to happen, and it did. It happened in the first century. And you know, this this Isaiah, we actually have copies of Isaiah um, that are going back to 1 to 200 B.C. Physical copies that can be read. You can read it online. It's in the Scroll Museum near Jerusalem. And uh, it's right there. It's, you can read the whole thing if you want to, if you can read Hebrew. But um, it's pretty amazing that they predicted what was going to happen. And it happened. Yahshua became the king. He became the one through whom we would receive Yahweh's righteousness and that's why Yahshua said John 14 6 I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me and so because of Yahweh and Yahshua's love for us Yahshua came and gave of himself that we might have life that we might have righteousness this is all because of Yahweh's love for us and in John 3 14 he said as Moshe lifted the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Did you know that the serpent was lifted up on a pole, not a cross? It was an upright stake. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, have everlasting eternal life. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the Son of Man was lifted up on the tree and he became that asham that offering to bring us Yahweh's righteousness for Elohim did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of Elohim what's his name Yahshua not Jesus, Yahshua. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. So, you condemn yourself by your own choice as to whether or not you decide that you're going to believe. I find it interesting that Yahshua is depicted as a serpent in the wilderness. The people looked upon the serpent and they were healed of the viper bites and they were not uh, they did not die from the snakes uh, bites and so I think the picture is that um, the enemy is going to attack us but we will be healed and we will prevail we will not die if we look to the Messiah Yahshua now why would he be pictured as a serpent because on him was laid the iniquity of us all and so all of our yuck was laid on him. And so this is beautiful in my opinion. This is uh, the prophecies of the prophets uh, coming to pass. It's one of the many reasons why I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. No one could have made this up. This is clearly the Scriptures are of divine origin. Because we have physical copies of Isaiah that predate the Messiah's life by some 200 years and yet they they just depict his life perfectly and it's really amazing so Isaiah 53 verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray everyone to his own way and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all hallelujah for that we needed that we needed Yahweh's righteousness so Yahshua bore our sin 
and we bear his righteousness. And Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He's not saying the law itself is a curse, but the law gives a curse to those who are disobedient to it. And so Yahshua redeemed us from the curse that the law gave us, which you will die. You are cursed for disobeying the word of Yahweh. And he became the curse for us because even in the Torah it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Yahshua was hung on a tree. And so he became cursed for us. But the Jews could not fathom that the Messiah would be hanged on a tree. They apparently did not understand the prophecies. And um, at least the ones who didn't accept him would not receive those prophecies. But, you know, it's through him that we are in we are allowed to have righteousness and that we are given righteousness and to me i just love that i love how the prophecies just point out the messiah so beautifully it's just really awesome so when paul's talking here in book of romans he's not just making up his own doctrines he's getting it from the holy scriptures Romans 5, verse 17 says, For if by the one man's offense, that is, Adam's, death reigned through the one, how much more, much more those who receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Yahshua, Messiah. Therefore, as though, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, that's Adam, resulting in condemnation even so through one's man one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification to life beautiful words here so adam was unrighteous and the second adam some people call yahshua the second adam uh, we are redeemed and we are caused to become righteous through one man's offense, we are made unrighteous. We are um, condemned. And one man's uh, righteous act, the free gift of grace, came to all men, resulting in justification to life. The only question is whether we're going to receive it. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Beautiful. I love it. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That means to demonstrate that we have offended Yahweh. He gave us his law, his standard of righteousness, and showed us that we have offended him. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Why? Because we received the Messiah, Yahshua. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Yahshua Messiah, our Master. And so we are granted grace through him. In the same way sin produced death, his righteous act gives us life. And grace will reign over, over sin. Where sin abounds, grace will abound much more. But then, the question obviously is, does that mean you can sin all you want? <laughs> and you'll be okay. Don't have to worry about it anymore. To which we have the answer in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Certainly not. This is the strongest possible objection in the Greek language. So how shall we? He asked the question. How can we even do it? He doesn't, fit, he doesn't understand how we can do this. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That means we died to sin. If we died to sin, we can't live in it. It doesn't work that way. You can't continue in sin that grace may abound and live in it. 
Or you do, do you not know that as many as of the, as many of us as were baptized, and here's where baptism comes in. As many of us as were baptized into Messiah Yahshua were baptized into his death. They were baptized into his death. Don't you know that? And so you died to sin, is what he's saying, because you were baptized into his death. Now, it tells me baptism means something. It's a symbol of the death you have to sin. So it has an important meaning for us to recognize. Therefore, we were buried with him, means we were buried with him through baptism into death, death to sin. That just as Messiah was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And so when you go down into the water, it is representing the death you have to sin, and therefore you no longer live in it, and what? Being renewed to a newness of life, that life is the Messiah Yeshua living in you. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And so this is what baptism is representing. Our mindset is the old man is dead and buried. We were buried with Messiah. We were crucified with him. And we died with him in the grave. As he went into the grave, all of our sin, all of our yuck went with him because he bore it. On him was laid the iniquity of of us all. And so all of our sin and the man of sin and the disgusting things the man of sin chose to do, that's all buried with him. And so now how can we claim that we are in him unless we refuse to continue in willful sin? Now, if somebody slips from time to time, it's a little different than you know, scripture says the righteous may fall seven times, but he gets back up again. Um, but the wicked, they fall and they lay in it. You know, they just kind of, like a pig going back to the to the mud after he's been washed, just kind of lay there in it and have a good old time and just go on living a life of sin. But uh, we've decided that we're going to put Yahshua on us. We're going to cause the old man to die. And we're going to walk in the newness of life. Yahshua is alive. He's not dead. He's alive. And so we walk in that newness of life, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin? When you receive the Messiah, Yahshua, you are not a slave or you're not addicted to anything. Yahweh says, you are not a slave to sin. It has no power over you at all. If we believe it, we'll act on that. If we don't believe it, we won't act on it. For he who has died has been freed from sin. We, we are not slaves of sin any longer. We are not under its power. See, the world that does not accept Yahshua the Messiah, they are slaves and they are captives and they are bound by the what's pictured in the Exodus as Pharaoh and the taskmasters, and they're still slaves of sin. And they can't stop. Only through the Messiah can we stop. And if we consider ourselves as being those who have died already, then we will act out what we believe, and we will not be overcome by sin, because we who have died have been freed from its power. And so Yahshua's death, our own participation in that death, brings us eternal life. And when we die with him, then we also will live with him. But first we've got to die with him. If you can get that, if you can make that a part of who you are, there won't be any sin that will have its bound on you. 
No, nothing can put you under its power. You can overcome any addiction, any struggle, any challenge, if you believe by faith, if you really, truly believe this word. I have been crucified with Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. You believe that, that you no longer live? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you say that with me? It is no longer I who live. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer I who live. It is Messiah who lives in me. That means the life you now live, you live by faith. In the Son of Elohim who loved you and gave himself for you. If you can get that in your mind, implant that word deep, deep, and, and become a part of your heart of who you are by faith. You don't consider yourself to even be alive anymore. It's only Yahshua who's alive in you. Think about that. Yahshua is living in you. Close your eyes and you think, okay, Yahshua is living in me. So what's Yahshua going to do next? What's he going to do next? Next time he's tempted. What's he going to do next time he's struggling with faith? What's he going to do? And you'll find when you tap into that kind of faith, you will walk as he did. And you've got to keep your mind focused on that. No matter what the distractions are, what would Yahshua do in this instance? Because it's not I who live, it's Yahshua lives in me. And so I'm supposed to be manifesting what his life is like. What would he be doing in this scenario? What would he do right now before he's going to bed? What would he be doing? What would he be doing at any instance, any moment, any day? What would he be doing? If you don't know, ask Yahweh to show you. Or ask Yahshua, what would you be doing right now? So we don't consider ourselves to be alive. We consider, consider Yahshua to be alive. It's not we who live. It's Messiah living in us. If that's true, then everything about yourself has died. No self-seeking, no works of the flesh, because it's dead. You can't offend a dead man, right? Ever seen a dead man get angry? Never have. When the flesh is dead, there's no works of the flesh proceeding from us. That's important if we believe that. It's something you receive, not something that you, by your own willpower, choose to try to live out. You receive it by faith. And you accept it by faith. And if you believe something, then the works will come out of that. That's the basis of what Yahshua did. And I wonder how many of us really ponder that. When you go down to baptismal waters, that is the death of the old man. The man of sin. The one who was under bondage. The one who had been slaved to sin. And the new man rose up. Now it's Yahshua living in you. And so when you're tempted to do some kind of wrong thing, you can say, I reject that in Amy Yahshua because I'm dead to that. The Bible tells me that. That was buried with the old man. That's not who I am. I've taken on a new identity. Yahshua living in me, that's my identity. That's who I am. And so you reject that in Yahshua's name. You're dead to those things. Whatever that might be. Anything. Any sin, you name it. You can reject it because you believe that you are dead to it. And if you believe you're dead to it, then you'll stop. And so it gives you the power to overcome by faith, not by your own willpower, but by faith. And Yahweh will work when you operate in faith. He will. So when we're approached to those things, you say, I'm not alive to that anymore. I'm dead to that. And that old man, he died. He went down the baptismal waters and off into the sea of forgetfulness. All my sins were washed away. So now Yahweh is my righteousness. Only in Yahweh I have righteousness and strength. 
the strength to overcome temptation. I have the strength to endure trials and tribulations and tests. And so our baptism is representing that thing that happened, that we believe and we know happened. Just as you believe in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. You believe that, right? That's a scripture in the book of Genesis. Well, here we see the book of Galatians. Do you believe this to be true? If you believe, you will overcome. If you don't believe, you'll struggle to overcome. So, listen, I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else. Don't get me wrong. In case you're wondering, I'm talking to myself. I don't claim to be perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, which is me. Okay? So, baptism is pretty awesome, if you really think about it. In him, Colossians 2.11, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body that sins the flesh. Physical circumcision puts off the foreskin. Spiritual circumcision puts off the body that sins of the flesh, the circumcision of Messiah. Buried with him in baptism. And baptism must matter in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of Elohim who raised him from the dead. Beautiful words. So, you got to accept it. It's the working of Elohim. That's what it is. The working of Elohim through what? Through faith. Through faith in the working of Elohim. You were raised. So in the same way we believe Yahshua was raised from the dead, we believe we are also raised. We have a new life. And baptism is representing that very change. The old man drowns. The new man rises up. Takes his place. And that man is Yahshua HaMashiach living in you. And that's why you are the body of the Messiah. That's why. So, hallelujah for that. And whatever sin anybody held against you or whatever from your past life or whatever doesn't really matter anymore because the one who holds the true record books Yahweh in heaven doesn't hold it against you no sin that you've done wrong no evil you've ever committed can be held against you because Yahshua he erased the record you're brand new it's as if you never sinned and so baptism is representing that change to those who receive it. So through him, we are made righteous. No matter how wicked we've been, no matter how awful things we've done. One person asked me a question one time, I recall. It was through the broadcast one time, a number of years ago. And they listed off somebody's sin. They did this, 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 this. And they said... Do you think that person could ever receive grace? And so I answered, I said, is their heart still beating? Because as long as our heart's beating, we have the opportunity to give our life to Yahshua and to have our sins washed away. But once it stops... It's too late. So there's grace available as long as our heart's beating. And so when you lay on your pillow and you, you, you hear your heart ticking away, you know there are thousands and thousands of people who don't wake up. And, uh, and that's a lot of people that don't wake up the next morning. So there's no guarantee of tomorrow. Ponder your life and choose. Yahshua. Romans 6, 8. Now if we die with Messiah, we believe we also shall live with him. Knowing that Messiah, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to Elohim. So though you may die physically and go into the grave and everybody would cry, you know, be sad you've gone to the grave. That's not it for you. 
you will be raised with him. Death does not have any dominion over you. But you don't, if you don't receive him, if you don't receive Yahshua, death will have dominion over you. And you will pay for your own sin. Yahshua will not bear that for you. You will pay for your own transgression. And so, let's receive him. So we're going to recognize, recognize that we ourselves are dead indeed to sin. You reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin. But alive to Elohim and Messiah Yahshua. Therefore do not let sin reign your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to Elohim as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to Elohim, because, hey, you are now part of that body of Messiah. You ever play an instrument before, like a, a saxophone or a guitar or something? Well, your, your, your body is an instrument. And before it was presented as an instrument of unrighteousness, but now it's presented as a member that creates an instrument of righteousness to Elohim. And so now your body can be used for righteous conduct and righteous behavior. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. If you were under Yahweh's law, you would be held to keeping it perfectly, and he would look at you and say, all right, you're not under grace. I see that. Well, let's see what the law says about your conduct. Looks like you sinned in this time and that time and this time and that time. Well, it doesn't look like you're going to make it, buddy, so I have to judge you for your own sin. But if you choose to be under grace, then he's going to say, yes, you've done these things, but you have received the righteousness I offered you when I laid your sin on the on the back of Yahshua HaMashiach as he was nailed to the tree for you, and you're under grace. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, which one's the better path? Well, <laughs> I take number two there. I mean, it's a little brainer for me. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law? Does that mean because you have under grace now, you can live how you want? Here's that word. Certainly not. We, uh, we were going over these scriptures the last couple of weeks, and I pound the table. <laughs> Absolutely not, because it's the strongest possible objection in the Greek language, right? Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves to whom you obey? So you put yourself back under slavery to sin, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So you don't just take this attitude, well, I'm under grace, I can live how I want. Absolutely not. It's because you're not under the law doesn't mean you're above the law either. Doesn't mean you're free to transgress it intentionally. Don't believe this the the ministers out there telling you, Oh, you're free to disobey the law of Yahweh. It's been abolished now. He took the law away so you wouldn't be regarded as a sinner. No. He didn't take his law away, he took your sin away. The law still stands. So, that's the bottom line. Yahshua did not die to abolish the law. He died to bear your sin, your transgressions of that law. And if he abolished the law when he died, then anyone who died, who lived after that, they have nothing to be convicted of, no sin to even be called sin because there's no law. They have nothing to repent of. So it doesn't make any sense. So I do believe we should obey the law of Yahweh. We should not sin. Sin is transgression of the law, according to 1 John 3, 4. Okay. So that's what the, what's being represented in baptism. And so if you're looking for peace, and you're looking to get out of the slavery to your own flesh, Yahshua is the answer. In him we have righteousness and strength. Unless we're, if you're looking for peace, you know, we cannot have peace unless we're at peace with our Father in heaven. It's a vain search. Unless we find at the end of that search, Yahshua HaMashiach, Yahshua our Master, our Redeemer, through him we have peace. He is the Prince of Peace. 
And so we're going to find that peace when we're reconciled to the one who made us. And that reconciliation that we have with him results in us having peace with each other. There's no peace, says the scriptures, for those who are wicked. Only peace will come when we turn to Yahweh and we let Yahshua bear our sin for us. And so we see in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, so-called, a great deal of effort has been made to show us the plan of salvation through Yahshua and how baptism is a depiction of what happens. It's the mechanics or the inner workings of what is going on. So that when Yahshua lives in us, we can overcome any addiction, any challenge, and we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors, Romans 8, 37. And that's an awesome, awesome promise. So we're going to do what Yahweh calls us to do. Whether it looks like a Jewish commandment or not, we're going to do what Yahweh's law tells us to do. And um, a lot of people in the Messianic movement have come to understand that. Um, I say Messianic, I mean those who have embraced both Old and New Testament as being a standard for righteous living. And uh, But in an effort to make baptism less Christian-looking and more Jewish-looking, maybe an appeal to Judaism and the Jews who are currently not believers, there's something being taught out there known as mikvah. Mikvah in mainline Judaism is when a person goes down, they dip themselves into the water and get immersed in water and perhaps wash and then rise up out of the water of their own accord. And uh, an example of where this would be done is in the book of Leviticus, chapter 15, verse 19, says, If a woman has a discharge, discharge from her body's blood, she shall be set apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean till evening. Everything that she lies on during her impurity shall be unclean. Also, everything that she sits on shall be unclean. Whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes, clothes and bathe, bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And so, you know, the this is also something that's done after one has marital relations. They're supposed to wash in water. And so, um, you know, the idea, all, well, baptism must come from this practice. And the Jews call that mikvah, bathing in water, and they're trying to accomplish that. And so the idea, they, they say, of baptism comes out of this concept of being washed from your uncleanness coming from the law of Yahweh. Well, looking at the word translated bathe, as in bathe in water, it comes from the Hebrew word rakatz. Rakatz means to wash, to wash away, to bathe, to wash, 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 wash. That's what it means. It means to wash. Now, I don't know about you, but when I take my bath, I don't just dip in the water and walk out. <laughs> I scrub my body. So something more than just a dipping in water happening here in the book of Leviticus and other places. And so where are they getting this idea of mikvah? Because rakats, that's not mikvah. That's a different word altogether. Well, in the book of Exodus chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, See, say to Aaron, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their, their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And so that's one example of where the word mikvah is used, and it's actually a noun describing the pools of water. Another example, um, Leviticus 11, 35 through 36, on, and everything on which a, a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean, whether it's an oven or a cooking stove, it shall be broken down. 
for they are unclean and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or cistern <clears throat> in which there is, the words translated plenty, but it means collection of water shall be unclean, shall be clean. Whoever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. <clears throat> so the word mikvah we have in this particular lexicon, we see mikvah here. Actually, it's translated hope, um, outcome, a collection, a collected mass. It's the second version here that is, because Hebrew words can have m multiple meanings. Um, we're talking about collection of threads here in linen yarn. Uh, gathering together here, pool, plenty. So, doesn't even really mean going down in water, just as it's a collection, in this case, of water. Another lexicon has here collection and collected mass and some examples in different script scriptures, all of water. Or a company of merchants, a collection of merchants, a drove or multitude of houses. And so it doesn't really mean, you know, for you to be mikvud. It's like saying that you're a collection. You got collected or something. It doesn't make any sense. And so what is the Hebrew word for baptism? Well, here's an example. Acts 8.36 says, now they, talking about um, a baptism. And eight, Luke 8, Acts 8.36, now they, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said to Philip, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And the word is baptizo in the Greek. Now, if you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, um, then we're going to find this word being used here. Talking about Naam and the Syrian. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of Elohim. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now this is the Hebrew word, tabal. And this same word is translated baptism, or baptizo. Uh, it's actually a different verb form of the same word, but the same word in its root, baptizo, is how they translated this Hebrew word, to ball. And so when you go back here, this word must also be coming from a Hebrew meaning of, or word to ball. And so baptism is to ball. <laughs> and it doesn't sound quite as, uh, I don't know, quite as nice to the ears. I was to ball the other day. <laughs> Mikvah sound a little bit better, maybe. But it uh, means to dip into, to plunge. So we're talking a full immersion here. And, uh, and so that's the meaning of the word. And actually I have copies of the Hebrew Matthew. And wherever they talk about baptism, this is maybe a 500-year-old manuscript, or so, four or 500 years old. And... and uh, this Hebrew Matthew actually uses the, the Hebrew word tabal whenever it's describing baptism. All right, so this uh, idea of Messianic movement teaching, uh, and I don't mean to, to separate myself from Messianics in the sense that I have a lot in common with those who identify Messianic because I believe in obeying both Old and New Testament commandments, uh, and I have a lot of similarities in my beliefs, but uh, I'm talking about, um, you know, what's, you know, widely taught among those who identify as Messianic. I have a difference here. I don't believe it's, it's accurate. Um, now, the second thing that I believe is done wrong is the way they do it. They believe that since the term mikvah is tied into this bathing aspect, that you do what you would normally do in a mikvah or rakhats. Right? You would go down the water, baptize yourself, dip yourself in the water, and stand back up again. That's the idea they have for baptism. And so basically, you squat. 
you go out there in the water, you squat down, you make sure the water goes over top of your head, and they call that a baptism. Now, if you were somehow unclean, uh, maybe you would do that. Hopefully, you also do some bathing, you know, scrub your body some too. Uh, you wouldn't, you know, but it means to wash, uh, is all it means. So, rakats means to wash. And so, that's how they do their baptisms. You know, they gather a bunch of people around and go out there into the water, and the guy squats in the water, everybody watches. He gets back up again, and he calls it a baptism. And that sounds a little, a little unusual to, and they think that's the correct way because it's more Hebraic. Um, and so I have a problem with that because Scripture does not teach that's the way it's done. In Acts 8.38 says, He commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water. They're both in the water. Philip and the eunuch went down the water, and he baptized him. Now, in the Greek, it's like the boy hit the ball. That's that's the the way it. Like there's one person performing the action upon another person, and uh, the same is true in the Aramaic New Testament as well. So he, who's he? He is Philip, right? There's nobody else around. Is he Philip dunked or? to bald him who's him that's the eunuch right so who did the action philip did the action does that make sense so he philip baptized to ball him the ethiopian philip immersed the ethiopian in water the ethiopian did not immerse himself philip did the immersing that's how it reads that's the meaning of it so the idea of going into the water and dropping yourself into the water is not the way that the early disciples were doing it. The one doing the action was the baptizer. Right? And those days came John the what? The immerser, the one that was tabaling everybody. The immerser, immersing everyone. He wouldn't be called the immerser unless he was immersing people. It doesn't say John the Watcher of, of Immersions. <laughs> it says John the Immerser, the one doing the action, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? That's what it's... I mean, by just common sense, you know, it doesn't say, you know, John who was watching people get baptized. No, the, he was actually doing the action. Okay? So it's important that we are baptized, and that we are baptized properly, and, and, and believe me, if you're baptized wrong, I don't believe somehow you don't have the Holy Spirit, or that um, Yahweh has rejected you, or that you're not his child because you were baptized the wrong way, or immersed, or mikvah the wrong, whatever, um, because your heart was in the right place, and he can accept if we do something wrong. But I would suggest... If you have not been baptized properly, then find some way to get it done correctly. That's my recommendation. And that's based on the scripture. All right. Now, we can't cleanse ourselves of our own sin, right? Right? We, we read that earlier. We can't cleanse ourselves. So we need Yahshua to do it for us, right? And I think that could be why there is a baptizer because it's no longer if I'm baptizing somebody right then it's no longer I who live it's Messiah who lives in me right and so if I was to baptize them it's really Yahshua in me who's baptizing them because we can't cleanse ourselves of our own sin right someone has to do it for you know Yahshua has to do that through me to show that representation correctly that he's the one cleansing me and so there needs to be a baptizer. And I think there's a spiritual reason for that. Yahshua is the one ultimately doing the action through us. The person, you know, I'm just a shell. I'm, the, I'm just a, the instrument he's using to baptize someone. And that's how I see it. 
We can wash your own body, but it takes Yahshua to give you full cleansing. So I think it matters. And so we need to do it the correct way. I mean, why, why go on doing something incorrectly once you know the right way to do it? That's how I look at it. And if you weren't done it right, then I would hope that you would want to go. And you want to be, when you face Yahweh on that final day, you want to go, well, yes, I was baptized the way you told me to do it to the best of my understanding. So that's our goal is to be able to say we've done this command correctly. So this scripture here, repent, let everyone be, be baptized, means someone's going to do it for you. Be baptized in the name of Yahshua Messiah for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. Now, this promise of the Holy Spirit, I believe after a baptism, that there is to be a time of laying on of hands. There's lots of examples in Scripture of that being done, and so that is something that we do. And so, and I also, when I do my baptisms, I do baptize in the name of Yahshua, the Messiah. Why do I do that? Why do I say in the name of Yahshua, the Messiah, I am baptizing you? Or I, I baptize you in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, is how the full Hebrew way of saying it. And I, that's, I say it that way for a reason. Um, because I believe the name we're baptized in needs to be correct to the best of our understanding. Now, um, what about this scripture? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, well there's three names, right? No, there isn't. Um, and I'll show you why. Actually, this is a major controversy in Christianity as to, you know, which way do you go? Which way do you go? Are you going to do the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Are you going to do it in the name of Jesus? And they're confused because there appear to be two scriptures contradicting one another. One saying you're going to be baptized in Yahshua, which is the Son's name. The other one says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So which is it? The answer is yes, they're both correct. <laughs> and uh, I'll explain to you why that is. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yahshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Yahshua means Yahweh saves. So you read that with that understanding. You shall call his name Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. How about that? Now it makes sense. You can't get that out of the name of Jesus. The name Yahshua means Yahweh saves. And so if we're looking for salvation, it's Yahweh who's going to save us because he's going to put his righteousness in the Messiah Yahshua and we are going to be saved through him. And actually, interestingly, since Yahshua means Yahweh saves, we have the name of the Father right here, Yahweh, uh, within the name of the Son. Actually, Yahshua said in John 5.43, it says, I have come in my Father's name. And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. So the name of the Father is literally in Yahshua's name because the name of, the, name of Yahshua actually is Yahweh is Salvation, or Yahweh saves. So, here's the name of the Father, Yahweh. Okay, Yahshua is Yahweh is salvation. And so we have the Father's name within the Son's name, right? Certainly a reference to it. And the name of the Holy Spirit, what about that one? John 14, 26 says, The Helper, the, helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in... My name, what's his name? Yahshua. The Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all things that I said to you. And so, within the name of Yahshua, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How about that? Hebrew roots solves the problem, brings unity among the churches, if they're willing to follow it, if they're willing to obey it and do what it says. Most people won't. But if they're willing to, it'll bring unity. Now, what about the name uh, Jesus? Where's Yahshua? Where's Yahweh in there? I don't see it. I'm looking. I see G. Um, I don't see Yahshua or Yahweh or any, anything there. Uh, where's the name of the Father at? You see it there anywhere? I'm looking. How about the name of the Son? That's not even the name of the Son. That's a... Actually, the name Jesus isn't even found in the 1611 King James Version because there was no letter J in those days. Uh, it's actually in the, in the 1611 King James. It has Jesus. It doesn't have Jesus. It's certainly not the Holy Spirit there. So I say, hey, once you know that's an error, why continue in it? How about we just go with what his name actually is? Because you find Yahweh's name there. If you say Yahweh really, really slowly, you say E A U A. E A U A. E A U A. E A U A. You say it fast as Yahweh. We go so slowly. You say, Yahweh. So we have Yahu. Yahu. Shua. Shua means salvation. Yahweh is in reference to Yahweh's name. You hear it? I do use a W there because if I put a U there instead of a W for Yahweh, I think people will get confused. And maybe pronounce it Yahweh or something. So I believe it's accurate. Yahshua. Simply, we have Yahweh. Yahweh. Don't, don't uh, vocalize the H. But the H is only demonstrating that this is an ah sound. Yahweh. So, Yah, don't do Yahweh. <laughs> That's why I put a W there, so people don't get confused. All right? And I put Yahweh. I don't want people to go Yahweh when they read. So, the W is simply a double U, right? A double U. All right, so I'm explaining that because some people ask that question. So, uh, in fact, in our English language, we sometimes substitute the W and the U. Sounds the same, like the word persuade. Sorry, I don't have that up there. It's kind of cut off at the bottom. But persuade, P-E-R-S-U-A-D-E. -E, and you can put a W in there and get you the same exact pronunciation. So... Persuade, persuade, persuade. It's all it's just a W, right? Okay. I'm just explaining that for those who have that question. Now, some people believe that when it says they're going to baptize in the name of Yahshua, that this is actually a metonymy. It's a figure of speech that consists of the use of one name, the name of one object or a concept for that of another to which it's related like scepter instead of sovereignty, or a bottle instead of strong drink, or count heads for counting people. So they're using one word to substitute another, and so there are people that believe that when you say, I'm going to baptize in the name of Yahshua, it's actually the name of Yahweh that you're baptizing in. Because Yahshua's name, one day we see it in Jeremiah 23, 5, is Yahweh Sidkenu. And so when it says they baptized in the name of Yahshua, they were actually baptizing in the name of Yahweh because Yahshua's name is Yahweh. <laughs> and so if you don't understand that, it's okay. But there's some people who believe that. I'm going to address that point. And we actually see quotations where the disciples, they weren't saying in Yahweh, they were saying that just like it says, 
For instance, they weren't using a metonymy here when Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Yahshua, Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This is a direct quotation here. Okay, so they're not saying like a, a metonymy. We're using one word to give a signal to another word. So I don't buy that in, buy into that at all. And uh, other places, um, this is a direct quotation, Acts 4, 9. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yahshua Messiah of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom Elohim raised from the dead by him, this man stands before you as whole. And so they were literally saying, by the name of Yahshua Messiah. Direct quotation. And he goes on to say, this, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So how's that for the importance of names? Right? I mean, names must matter, or you wouldn't have said this, right? No, now, I'm not judging and say if you, if you use the name Jesus that he didn't save you or whatever, because Yahweh... As many scriptures as there are to talk about what he expects of us, there are just as many that talk about how merciful he is, especially if we don't know any better. So I'm not judging. I'm saying, look at how important it is. It must matter. It must be important, and so I don't want to change it. I don't want to alter it. Now, the word Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the word name, shame, means both literal name, written and spoken name, and one's character and so you're speaking like if I say I come to you in the name of peace um, so there's a there's a character of peace characteristic of peace Yahshua came both literally in his father's name and in his father's character and in my opinion there's no, no we have no business changing that at all and so yes I do believe we should be baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And so if you have never been baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, and you want to be baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, uh, I am willing to do so, and I know of other brothers who are willing to do that. And all you got to do is just contact me, disciple at Eliyah.com, and I will do my best to find someone that will baptize you. And if they're not close to you, hopefully... If you're um, dedicated and you're able to, you'll travel land and sea if necessary to get baptized. I know one brother who came all the way from Norway to get baptized. Another person came from Germany to get baptized. I know one woman that came to Australia from Australia to get baptized. So I'm not saying you have to, but if you know you have the the means, uh, it's a very important decision. We want to do it and do it right. So. Now, another error I believe it goes out there today is that, oh, you got to have a long list of qualifications, and then you can get baptized. I know one denomination has a two- or three-page questionnaire. You must fill out before they will be willing to, be, to baptize you. Um, and so you got to fill out the questionnaire. you got to be willing to adhere to the doctrines of that particular congregation. And um, and so, unless you adhere to those creeds and, and doctrines, they're not willing to baptize you. Now, I don't do that. What I see in Scripture and what Scripture is requiring uh, is that you have a heart willing to walk in righteousness, to turn away from unrighteousness, to repent to believe in the Messiah Yahshua, the Son of Yahweh. And that's all I require of you. No denominational doctrines, no signatures, no agreements. You want to walk out your, your repentance and faith in Yahweh. I will explain to you 
what it means to be baptized as I have in this study today. But um, all I want to know, do they believe in Yahshua truly? And they, are they committed and repentant in their actions? And so then I'll ask them, well, do you believe that Yahshua is the son of the living Elohim and through him, through faith and repentance and baptism in his name, you receive full from full remission of sins, and they say yes. I'll say, all right, all right. I baptize you in the name of Yahshua Hamashiach, and I will put them in the water. I do go backwards because I think that's the most involuntary position for the individual to go is backwards. I mean, if they go forward, they can kind of control their movements, um, whereas we want Yahshua to be the one to do it, not themselves. They can't make themselves clean. So. If they go into the water and someone puts them in the water and brings them back up, that's a representation of Yahshua bringing them back up. And so I do baptize people uh, going backwards. Now there are some people for medical reasons or something uh, or whatever that we might try to look at another way of doing it. But they have to. I have to stress that it has to be involuntary on their part. So has to do with him. It's not about me. Um, it's about him, and uh, it doesn't matter. Does, does a person have to be an elder? Not that I know of. I don't see Philip wasn't necessarily an elder yet. He was an evangelist. He did baptize people, and so uh, who did he baptize? You know, there's a man named uh, Simon the sorcerer. Acts chapter eight, and verse nine. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished his people of Samaria, claiming he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of Elohim. And they heeded him a long time because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of Elohim and the name of Yahshua Messiah, both men and women were baptized, and Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. And when Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that any one on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of Elohim could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of Elohim. Repent therefore of this, your wickedness, and pray, Elohim, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Whoa. This is a man who was allowed to get baptized. And yet he was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. There must not have been a 55-page questionnaire. <laughs> Um, he, do you want to, are you repentant? Are you sincere? And all the best they could tell he was. And, uh, and they baptized him. And his conscience from there is completely up to him. It's what he does. Now, I think he was poisoned by bitterness because he saw these men were getting the attention now. And he was kind of bitter about that. And so he was bound by that. And he wasn't getting the attention anymore. But, so he wanted to get the attention, and so he wanted to have this power they had. They thought he, he thought he could buy it, and he responded in a very humble way. He says, "Well, pray for the the things you spoke of will not happen to me," and that was a very humble thing to do. Now, when should someone get baptized? Should they? Um, how long do you wait after you if you come to belief in Messiah Yeshua? and you decide you're going to repent, how much time should transpire before you actually get baptized? Well, let's take a look in the scriptures and see what the early 
apostles were doing. Acts 9.17 says, Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Messiah, the Messiah, Master Yahshua, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And um, I guess I don't have the rest of that verse. But he immediately was baptized. He got baptized right away. And, um, and so there wasn't any time delay or anything like that. Uh, verse 18. Oh, I'm sorry, it does say that. He rose and was baptized. Sorry, I was distracted for a minute there. So he was baptized. Hallelujah. Now this is a man that was on the road ready to kill people. And blam. Met Yahshua, filled with the Spirit, got healed, got baptized. No time to waste. Right? Acts 16.31 so they said, Believe on the Master Yahshua Messiah, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Master to him, to all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and watched their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Didn't wait around. When he believed, he got baptized. Immediately. Immediately. He and all his family were baptized. His whole family was. No beating around the bush. Another place, Acts 22, verse 16. Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of Yahweh. What you waiting on? Let's get it done. And there's some people listening today who are waiting. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of Yahweh. If you've repented, my brothers and sisters, and you're a believer in Yahshua, you've not been baptized, why are you waiting? Why do you wait? Why do you tarry? Maybe some of you can't be. You're on a place, you say, uh, well, uh, I don't know of anybody that will baptize me in Yahshua's name. Okay, all right. But do what you can to have it done. And it's important it be done immediately. And that's the way they operated in the first century. Now, if you were baptized in the wrong name, you know, maybe you were baptized in the name of Jesus or Father, Son, Holy Spirit or, or whatever. Um, not saying that you haven't been saved or he doesn't love you, you haven't been accepted. Or maybe you were mikvahed instead of not baptized correctly. You were, you just somehow that had it done wrong, self-baptism or whatever. I mean, if I was sprinkled in the name of Yahshua, I would want to go back and do it right. So that I can stand before him and say, all right, I was baptized in your name. So, you know, go back and do it right. That way you can stand before him and say, yeah, I've been baptized the way you told me to get baptized. Now, what about the age of baptism? Some say, well, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to be a certain age. Some believe the age is 20. Um, I hope not. I was baptized at age 19. But that's the only time I've ever been baptized. And I'm now 46 years of age. But um, what is the age? I believe you're accountable when you know. I mean, you don't have to wait till you're 20 to know that murder is wrong <laughs> and be accountable for that, right? So when you know something's wrong, you're accountable for it. I don't care if you're 3 or you're 30. If you know what's wrong and you do it anyway, you are accountable for that, for that thing, that wrong. Now, I know that Yahweh chose to have mercy on the children of those who were wicked in the wilderness. I recognize that. Um, and that they were, you know, in a, under authority and they really couldn't make their own decisions and whatnot. I recognize that. And so he had mercy on them because they were not able to fully do what they felt they wanted to do. But look what Yahshua said about baptism. 
John 3, 5, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of Elohim. So upon hearing this, I say, do what you need to do to get baptized. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're three months or three, 30 years or whatever, because if, you're, if you have children, I do believe in baptizing children. I know that's very controversial because, you know, some people hold the age of accountability idea. Um, but I say, if you have to be born of water to enter, I want to make sure my children will enter. You know, I, I don't want to wait. Every, everything else, every other act of obedience, I cause them to do when they're little. I cause them to stop lying. I cause them to observe the Sabbath. I cause them to uh, honor their parents. I cause them to do all these things. And so a baptism is just an, an act of obedience. One of the first things that a person would do, then why wait? I'm going to cause them to be baptized. And if they later on choose to be to agree with that baptism, and fine. Hallelujah. That's my hope. But um, the evidence for me is, you know, we have whole families getting baptized. Uh, we see that here in um, Acts 16. He and all his family, every single one of them, were all baptized. I presume there would have been children there as part of his family. Uh, so I don't wait. If someone wants me to baptize their child, I don't care how old they are, I will. I don't want them to be born of water and the Spirit, and I will baptize them. Um, so that's what I do. I know it's controversial. So, it's important. It's important that we get baptized. We want to be born of the water and the Spirit, and we want to walk out obedience to Yahweh's Word. We are the ones who are afar off. All who are afar off. And we want the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? We want Yahweh's Spirit to dwell in us. And I know that actually Yahweh can send his spirit before one's baptized. We see an example of that with Cornelius. The Holy Spirit came upon them the minute they believed. Um, but, you know, we need, as brothers and sisters in the faith, we need to be baptized. And so, now, the very key things that we need to understand as believers is repentance and faith in the Messiah Yahshua. And once we have those things, we understand those things, we can be baptized. Now, you know, someone says, well, what about children? They can't repent. You know, yes, they can. Uh, I know babies maybe can't. But um, in the sense that they need to be born of water, I'm not going to I'm not going to hold them back either. I'm going to say, let them and if a little child wants to be baptized let me ask you a question it says here pardon me if a son asks for a bread from any father among you will he give him a stone if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent instead of a fish if he asks for an egg will he offer him a scorpion if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much will your heavenly father give the holy spirit to those who ask Right, And we also know, Yahshua says, Let the little children come to me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to let the little children come to him. I'm not going to turn them away. Say, no, you're not old enough. So Yahweh wants to pour out his Holy Spirit upon you. He wants that Holy Spirit to fill you, that spirit of truth. Yahshua says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. Spirit 
of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Beautiful words by our Master here. So he's willing to lead you by his Spirit. You need to seek it. You need to walk it. You need to live it. In baptism, we're saying, I'm willing to receive it. Yahshua says, I have still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, John 16, 12. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Hallelujah. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Spirit reminds us of the word of Yahweh. Scripture says the mercy of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness, his righteousness to children's children, grandchildren, to such as keep his covenant, to those who remember his commandments to do them. Psalm 30 verse 4 says, Sing praises to Yahweh, you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His grace, his favor, is for a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. That's the change we're looking for in the morning. The morning is compared in Scripture to the resurrection. When our suffering and weeping in the darkness of this age will cease, and a shout of joy comes as the new age dawns. I say we live out like changed men now. Let's live out that changed life now. Where the old man has died, and the new man, Yahshua, is dwelling in us. And by that, the kingdom of Elohim is manifested as we manifest the life of Yahshua. Let's endeavor to make our calling sure. Allowing Yahshua to live in his fullness walking as he walked, keeping the Torah as he did, manifesting his life on the earth as the old man dies. And we put on the Messiah Yahshua. Let's do that. And let's pray. Oh, Father Yahweh, thank you, Father Yahweh, for this concept that you've given us of baptism, this beautiful, beautiful word, Father, from the scriptures and the promise that you give us, I pray that each and every person within the sound of my voice will will take this this word about the death of the old man and the new man Yahshua living in us, and let that empower them, empower them to be overcomers, to know they are not enslaved to sin. They are set free by the body of Messiah. The body of sin is done away with. And the new man, Yahshua the Messiah living in us, has taken his place, all pictured in baptism. And Father, if there are any who are needing baptism, who cannot be baptized for one reason or another, we pray, Father Yahweh, you would open up the door for that to take place. It's so important that we do what your word has said. And those who are willing to make sacrifices and make long trips, or whatever they need to do to come and be baptized in Yahshua's name, I pray that you would honor their faith, that you would remember them, and that you would pour out upon them an extra measure of your Holy Spirit, that your name might be glorified above all names. For truly yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. And all praise, honor, and worship belongs to you, Yahweh our mighty one, Yahweh Eloheinu, forever and ever. In Yahshua's great name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.